Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. <laughs> I'm Susan Haypatrick, Chief Executive Officer of United Way of Missoula County. We are a proud founding member of Let's Move Missoula. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, it is a long day, but we know it will be a good one. And those of us on the planning team are excited about the day and grateful to you for giving up your Saturday uh, to spend some time listening, learning, sharing information, and coming up with recommendations for what our community can do to address childhood obesity. Because obesity is even worse for our kids than we thought. That's the conclusion of a study just published in the British Medical Journal that analyzed a whole bunch of studies on body mass index in kids and risk factors for cardiovascular disease. The studies looked at nearly 50,000 children. The researchers found that obesity doubles or triples the risk of high blood pressure in children and in some cases, caused hardening of the arteries in kids as young as age nine. We need to be worrying sooner about kids, the researchers said, and we need to drastically step up our work for prevention because the implications for the future health of overweight and obese children are even worse than had previously been suggested. You may have seen a Missoulian article in the last week citing a study by the Trust for America's Health that predicts that by 2030, more than half the people in the vast majority of states will be obese. In Montana, current obesity rates 25%, 54% predicted by 2030. But we don't need to look at the British Medical Journal or the national media for statistics that alarm us. We don't need to look any farther than the Missoula third grade. The 2010-11 Body Mass Index survey of 800 Missoula third grade students revealed that 27% of them were overweight, and of that 27%, 12% were obese. But it's not just little kids. During the same period, BMI numbers for 7,600 students here at the University of Montana, about half the student population, showed that 40% of those students were overweight and 14% of them were obese. These numbers don't square with the image we have of our happy, healthy, family-friendly community of cyclists and runners and swimmers and triathletes a community that prides itself on its farmer's markets, its restaurants and schools and hospitals and university serving locally grown food, its great environment, I mean present hazy, smoky conditions accepted, but it's generally great environment. So we are here today to work on ways to make the reality match the image, to hear from national experts about strategies that can work right here in Missoula, in our city, in our schools, in our childcare settings, as we address this troubling epidemic. Because we can't afford not to. The cost implications down the road for treating type 2 diabetes and heart disease alone are staggering. There are all kinds of implications for our kids' health and self-esteem, and even for our country's security. Just last Tuesday, childhood obesity became a military matter when 300 retired generals and admirals signed on to a campaign to urge the civilian community, that's all of us, to reduce the easy availability of junk food. They argue that childhood obesity is a threat to national security. About one in four American adults is now too overweight to join the military. Being overweight or obese is the number one medical reason why young adults cannot enlist. Millions of them are literally too fat to fight. 
So all of us are here today to fight a different battle, wage a different war, one for our children's futures. As Ellen Leahy, the director of the City County Health Department says, with tobacco, we had one enemy, the tobacco industry. With obesity, we have to fight it on every front. We can point fingers in every direction, at our sedentary lifestyle, at a family history of overweight or obesity, at the easy availability of low-cost, high-fat foods and sugared drinks, at a built environment that impedes folks' ability to walk and play outside, at the lack of fresh fruits and vegetables at stores in poor neighborhoods, at meals in schools and daycares that aren't as healthy as they could be, at aggressive advertising that targets kids, at how food is produced and marketed, and the list goes on. But our Let's Move Coalition focuses more on fixing the problem than on fixing blame. And that's why we planned this summit and why we brought all of you here today to learn from each other and from nationally respected experts about what we can do to encourage kids and families to eat better and move more. So speaking of Let's Move Missoula, I want to introduce and thank my fellow movers, the planning group behind today's summit who did everything from finding the speakers to raising and donating money to putting Live United stickers on 250 apples. Um, so first, Missoula City County Health Director Ellen Leahy, who first had the vision that we needed to come together as a community to address childhood obesity. Donna Gockler, Director of Missoula Parks and Recreation. John Lang, CEO of Missoula Family YMCA. Mary Pittaway, Nutrition Services Director for the Health Department. Mary Windecker, Vice President of Planning and Marketing at Community Medical Center. My colleagues, Michael Moore and Michelle Eckert, the uh, best apple stickerers in Montana. Um, and a true force behind the summit and behind the body mass index survey and involved in so much else in our community, Mary McCourt, health promotions guru at the health department. Um, her fingerprints are all over this summit and please join me in applauding her and the rest of the team. Thanks also to our fellow Let's Move Missoula partners who are listed in your packet. We are very proud that we have involved such a wide range of people and organizations in Missoula. Special thanks to our sponsors, without whom none of this would be possible. Missoula City County Health Department, Montana Department of Public Health and Human Services, United Way of Missoula County, Missoula County Public Schools, and our school superintendent, Dr. Alex Apostle, is here today. Community Medical Center, Providence St. Patrick Hospital, the Missoulian, the Orange Street Food Farm, which donated the apples, and for donating raffle prizes, the Good Food Store, the Double Tree Hotel, and its restaurant, Finn and Porter. I'll talk a minute about, in a minute about the raffle. Um, well, maybe I'll talk about the raffle right now. We have a, a night stay at the Double Tree and a $50 gift certificate at Finn and Porter. And we also have four $25 gift certificates at the Good Food Store. And you are all eligible to win those if you stay till the end of the day and return your evaluation forms. Um, so we're grateful to those sponsors, and I think you'll agree those are terrific prizes. Um, those of you who are here for continuing education credits, you must sign in separately uh, according to your profession. So if you're a nutritionist, uh, don't sign in with the nurses. Um, there are sign-in sheets on the table if you haven't done that already. And you must turn in your evaluation at the end of the day, um, or you won't get your continuing education certificate. Um, there is, we have a lot of great information in our packet, in the orange packet. And I'm going to review it with you now. Um, oh yeah, and the first 40 people who turn in their evaluations get one of these cool hit the tap bottles from Mountain Water. Mountain Water is a partner with the health department in ensuring that there's good drinking water at places where people gather and, and work and play. So $40, or 40 uh, hit the tap bottles for the first 40 of you who complete the evaluation. So in addition, in the packet, in addition to your agenda, we have a proclamation. Today is Let's Move Missoula Day. 
in the city of Missoula. We have letters from uh, Senator Max Baucus and Senator John Tester. Senator Baucus talks about when he walked across the state of Montana. Um, lots of really inf informa good information, easy tips that we can implement in our own lives and organizations. I love of think your of your dog as a treadmill with hair. Um, one of the health department promotions, 5210. Uh, Eat five fruits and veggies a day, limit screen time to two hours, one hour of physical activity, and zero sugared beverages. There's also the evaluation form. There is a piece by Mark Fenton, who I'm going to introduce in a minute, and a lot of other good stuff about Let's Move Missoula and from our partners that, that we work with to make uh, the, the reality of Missoula uh, closer to our, the image that we have of our community. Mary, have I forgotten anything? Either Mary, Pitaway, or McCourt. Okay. Um, you'll hear from me again uh, periodically during the day as we outline our schedule. But for now, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Mark Fenton. Mark is here from Situate, Massachusetts. Say that five times fast. Um, he is a, and he's been here before. Uh, he's a national public health planning and transportation consultant and an adjunct associate professor at Tuf Uni Tufts University's Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy. If you ever watched America's Walking on PBS, Mark was the host of that. He's written numerous books, including the best-selling Complete Guide to Walking for Health, Weight Loss, and Fitness. He works with organizations and communities around the country to build environments, policies, and programs that help create places where more people can walk, bicycle, and take mass transit. He developed the University of North Carolina's Safe, Scoot, Safe Routes to Schools Clearinghouse and served as a facilitator for the Walkable Community Workshop Series of the National Center for Bicycling and Walking. He has a master's degree from MIT in engineering, and we are delighted to have him here today, Mark Fenton. Good morning. Thank you very much. Thank you for that very kind introduction, which was much too generous and would probably have been better said, Mark Fenton is a walking nerd, right? If you're going to boil it all down, he's kind of a nerd for walking. Um, uh, it's a delight to be back, and, and I'm going to be a very ungrateful guest, because here you are showing great hospitality, inviting me back to, um, is that inviting me back to Missoula, which I, I greatly appreciate. And I'm going to be ungrateful because I'm going to um, very much challenge you. I see my job is not to give you the good news about how great it's going. Sorry about that. I'm not going to do that to you guys. The problem is I don't stand still very well. So, but we're going to see if this will cut me a little slack. Not much. Okay. Go back to this one, guys, because uh, I'm thinking this is just not doing it. Hello? What? Yeah, that's not either. Oh, I hate when this happens. I hate it. Um, I'm going to talk about stickiness. That's the word you're going to learn from me today, stickiness. And I'm going to challenge you to, through the course of the day, because we're hoping you're going to stay for the whole day and be part of the problem solving that we do later. We're going to break into sessions where we actually work on concrete ideas for the region. And when I say we, I mean we, you guys. We're going to ask you to be part of generating concrete action steps. And my measure of success will be how sticky. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at stickiness. And, and I'm going to teach you about that right now. Um, I love a picture like that. I love seeing those four kids walking to school at Russell Elementary. That's sort of my model of success. But that's not the norm. If you listen closely to Susan, 
That's not what's happening over, frankly, all of America, or can we say with confidence, all over Missoula, unfortunately. Um, and I think you are like, like other cities around America where you would show up and see um, lots of bike lanes and a great trail system and so on, there's kind of this schizophrenia. The schizophrenia between the fitness haves and have nots, if you will. The people who think about what they eat and get out and exercise and take advantage of the system every day. And then the rest of the population, which looks like most of the United States, that's really busy and working one and a half jobs during the recession and trying to raise three kids and maybe they're a single parent or they're a household where both parents are working and they don't have time for a membership at a health club or to own a fancy $3,000 bike and go train for long bike rides on the weekends. We're talking about the regular people who are struggling with all of the data that you just shared with us, Susan. That's who we have to think about. Not just the sort of the fitness and nutrition elite, but everybody else. So with that, I'm going to essentially hit on... Um, Four things. A little bit of perspective. I'm going to ask you to think about some perspective on this problem and my brief rant about the epidemic. And I, I'm sorry, the price of admission with a Fenton talk is you got to hear the rant. Everybody hears the rant. It'll be short. Then I'm going to talk about the bad news, my take on sort of where we are in public health and around especially physical activity. The good news, which is I think we have a prescription. We know where to go with this. And the hard news, which is that it is not about the money, waving a magic wand and just spending lots to fix the problem. It is about nuts and bolts, policy decisions that we make every day in our communities at the level of school boards and neighborhood associations and city councils and planning commissions. That routine stuff that's either going to make or break our battle in this epidemic. And I mean this quite sincerely. That's going to make or break it. And that's harder. It's much harder than going and just getting a big grant and giving everybody pedometers. You know, oh great, I wish it was that easy. It, it isn't. So having said that, I'm going to ask you to join me in a little mental exercise. What I'd like you to do is think back to your earliest fond recollection of having been physically active as a youngster. And I'm talking a little kid. I'm not talking high school sports here. I'm not talking when you won the state championships. I'm talking about when you were a little shrimp, the earliest thing you remember being physically active and you have some fondness for, okay? Everybody think back to that. Now turn to the person next to you and share those recollections, okay? Right now, 20 seconds. Just take a few, talk about those recollections. Okay, so here's the bad news. The bad news is it would be far more fun to spend the next 45 minutes having those conversations than listening to me, because it's really fun. I watch a room full of people doing this, and they get animated. They act out climbing trees and riding bikes and playing Foursquare, being the Foursquare champion, I learn. Uh, so I'll be interested to hear about that. Um, um, pick up games in the neighborhood, playing Army or Cowboys and Indians with your buddies and just sticks and things like that. I'm going to ask a series of questions about your recollection. I want you to raise your hand if your answer is affirmative, okay? So listen closely now. How many of you recalled an activity that occurred at a designated time and place? You had to be at a designated time and place. Hands up for that. How many recalled an activity where um, you were only with kids of the same age and gender? So you're, if you're a 10-year-old boy, you're only with 10-year-old boys. How many remember an activity where you um, had to have an adult present to do it? Had to have an adult present. How about an activity where um, you had a uniform? You had to have a uniform to do it. You got one from the team or something. How about an activity where there had to be a referee or an umpire? Hands up for those. Handful of those. Okay. How many remember an activity where uh, there, um, you were with kids of different ages and different genders? So you might have been older kids, younger kids, boys and girls playing together. How about where there didn't have to be an adult present? Hands up for those. How many had an activity they could not have gotten away with if an adult had actually been present? <laughs> yeah, a lot of those. Yeah, damming up the creek out in the behind so-and-so's house so he can make a pool. Yeah, no, we never got yelled at for that. How many had a wheeled vehicle as part of their recollection? A bicycle, a tricycle, a scooter, maybe a skateboard that you had built yourself? How about water being part of your recollection? Swimming in it, fishing on it, splashing in a creek, skating on a frozen pond, any of those? All right. If you'll allow me to use a term of art that will be familiar but not in this context, how many of you to some degree or another remember having been a free-range kid? Kind of a free-range kid. How many could disappear on a Saturday morning with a passel of friends and be told to be home either at lunch or maybe an evening or maybe when the street lights came on? Who had a street light sort of? Who had a fort in the woods somewhere? All right. Or in a field or wherever. Even, by the way, I could have a room full of urban kids and they'd be saying, yeah, we had that lot in the neighborhood that we played the pickup games of football or stickball. Okay, two more questions and these are the only things that really matter. How many of you believe the majority of children today in America are free-range kids? Yeah, we've got majority free-range kids in America. Look around the room. Don't look at me. How many hands are up? Last question. 
How many think it's good for the health of American kids that they're not free range? Yeah, it's a good thing we don't have free range kids anymore. Fighting the childhood obesity epidemic. Hands up for that. Good thing we don't have free range kids, huh? Look around. So let's think about what we just said. As recently as a generation or two ago, we had lots of free range kids. We all agree we have far fewer now, and we all agree it's not good for them. My simple question is this What are you gonna do about it? It's not a rhetorical question. You got it. That's why we're here. And it's why you're going to hear a very different presentation from me than you might have expected. Because I believe at its heart, that's what we have to do. Restore a world for free-range kids. And if we get that right and think about all of what the research tells us is the best ways to do that, it can really make a difference. I am not a particularly smart guy. There are much smarter people than I talking about this. A guy named Richard Louvre wrote a fantastic book called Last Child in the Woods. He actually coined the term nature deficit disorder. How about that? And to his credit, rather than saying we got to give kids drugs for it, we say we got to get them back outside. A woman named Shane Gould, I spoke at the Australian National Physical Activity Conference last year, or yes, last year, and she and others, kind of child health advocates, have come out to say not only are kids at risk for a whole host of physiological ailments if they're not physically active, the kinds of things that Louvre catalogs in his book, she says, what about developmentally? She said, what happens to all the skills that we developed when we were free-range kids, playing unconstrained games without an adult there to tell us when to start. How about the, the sort of the leadership skills of picking teams and making up rules or the negotiation skills of arguing when something goes out of bounds or the inventiveness of making up your own games? All skills, by the way, we use as successful adults that we started developing when we were doing those pickup games of uh, whatever we played as kids, right? She really asked some interesting questions about it. Now, when we ask American parents today, why don't you let your kid walk to school? Why can't you let uh, a little Timmy disappear on a Saturday morning with a passel of friends on bicycles and show up at noon? What's their answer? We, we can't do that because why? It's not safe. There are terrible, horrifying, scary men with big, thick mustaches hiding behind every tree. <laughs> Ready to pluck them from the street. So my question to you is this. What is the percentage increase in violent crime against kids by people who don't know them? I'm not talking about domestic violence now. I'm talking about, you know, sort of the scary man behind the tree. What's the increase over the last, call it, 30 or 40 years? And in fact, let's pick the time span, just for convenience, over which the percentage of kids who walked and biked to school, the green bar, dropped from over 40% to about 15% of all trips to school. And the percentage of kids being driven to school by mom or dad in a car rose from 15 to almost 50%. A dramatic reversal in just 30 or 40 years. What's the increase in violence against kids? Oh, by the way, that happens to be, happens to be by chance, the same exact time span in which childhood obesity rates tripled. Coincidence? I don't think so. That dramatic change in which we throw our kids into the backseat of the car for everything, not just going to school, to a friend's house, to the mall, to sports, to anything they're doing, coincides perfectly with this dramatic increase in childhood obesity. It's not accidental. And by the way, the increase in violence, crime against kids over that time is about what? You said that with a lot of confidence. He said zero. Do you know that to be true? That special issue of Time Magazine looked very closely at the pro that problem, as did we at the National Center for Safe Routes to School at University of North Carolina. There's no evidence it's worse. If anything, it's probably less. Probably because even now, fewer kids ever than ever are out on the street. But most importantly, what taints this is that when there's one incident in New York, there's an Amber Alert. We hear about it here in Montana and out in California. And trust me on this. I don't trivialize this problem. I know there are issues in neighborhoods and parts of the country and, and, and certain areas. I'm a parent of a 14-year-old girl and a 17-year-old boy. I am exceptionally careful about where they go, with who, when. But what I think is this. It is not okay for me to simply say it's not safe out there. I guess I'm going to just throw up my hands in despair and throw them in the car for everything. I think my job is to take care of the places where it's not safe enough, make it safer, and get my kids back outside. That must be our goal. Anything less is an abdication to that data that we just talked about. And that's not why you're here. You're here because you want to do something about it. Now, here's the other part of my rant. This is the epidemic everybody wants to talk about. It gains a lot of traction in the media. Everybody wants to talk about it. There's, I could show you, I could 
we could do a show of all the headlines that talked about obesity, adult and childhood obesity epidemic. I think we don't do a great service if that's all we talk about. And you know, this is the data that shows the percentage of American adults with a BMI over 30, and now we're at fully a third of the adult population, and no indication that that trend is slowing, particularly. Um, Yet I think it misses the point, and it's well illustrated by this special issue of Time that looked at a disease that we used to call adult onset diabetes. What's the clinical term for that? Do you guys all know this? What's the clinical term for adult onset diabetes? Type 2 diabetes. Why don't we call it adult onset anymore? We're seeing it in 9 and 10 year olds. 20 years ago, medical profession didn't think that happened. That's why they called it adult onset. Now we see it in kids. Now, the special issue talked a lot about nutrition. It talked a lot about drug research and genetics and what your proclivity to type 2 diabetes is and gave one half of one column of a six-page article to, I think, the most important research in the field in the last 20 years called the DPP or Diabetes Prevention Program. Did a very interesting thing. It took 3,000 people from all over the United States of different ages and incomes and ethnic backgrounds and education levels with one thing in common. They were at risk for, but had not yet developed type 2 diabetes. So they were pre-diabetic, fasting elevated, uh, elevated fasting glucose. Um, put them in one of three intervention groups. One group got the standard counseling that we give now. Here's a pamphlet and some information about diet and exercise, and here's a pill. Take it every day. Second group got the same exact counseling and information, and they got a pill too. And what they didn't know, half of them were getting metformin, which is a diabetes drug, and half were getting a placebo. Pill didn't do anything. It's called a randomized controlled trial, and even the physicians don't know who's getting drugs and who isn't. So it's a very powerful form of research because you really see if there's an effect. Interestingly enough, there was a third group in the study. And they didn't get the standard counseling, nor did they get a pill. What they got was put in an intensive lifestyle modification program that included things like shopping and cooking classes. So they learned how to purchase and prepare much healthier foods. And they got at least 30 minutes of physical activity a day, at least five days a week, or on average about 150 minutes of physical activity a week. Let me be clear, these guys were not training for a marathon. They were going out for a half hour walk most days of the week. That's kind of what was happening. Can anybody tell me which group did uh, best in the study? Who performed best? Number three, am I hearing? Better be or what am I talking about, right? Why are we here? So here's the interesting thing. The folks that got metformin, that got the drug, saw a 30% reduction in risk of developing type 2 diabetes. That would have been the big news. 30% risk reduction. We do not see that in intervention trials ever. Reducing the risk of a very costly chronic disease by 30%. That would have been exceptional, except for one tiny little thing. The people in the lifestyle intervention saw almost twice the reduction in risk. Almost a 60% reduction in risk by virtue of changing lifestyle, not starting on drugs sooner. And that leads me to my rant, which is quite simply this. As long as we keep talking about the obesity epidemic, I think sometimes we miss the underlying intervention, the underlying two behaviors that this study focused on and proved can make the difference, physical inactivity and poor nutrition. And if you ask me what we should be talking about, we should be talking about America's twin epidemics of physical inactivity and poor nutrition. That's the story. And by the way, when we do that, we get people off of this self-punishment that they do when they think, well, I'm just part of the obesity epidemic because I'm a bad fat person. I mean that sincerely. I may be dead wrong. You may be saying, well, who are you, some skinny guy telling us this? But I've got to tell you, my experience is when I talk about the obesity epidemic, many people just close right up because they feel like they're part of it and they're the problem and it's all about their personal responsibility. So my simple question is this. By the way, it also, if, you, if I may, moves us into pure treatment mode. I believe many people, when we talk about the obesity epidemic, are asking two questions. When's the leptin drug going to be ready? You know, the magic bullet pill. And... When is a person heavy enough for bariatric surgery? We're already treating rather than really preventing, which is what these two behaviors are about. Last point, these are both independent risk factors. We know that if we can get a person to be more physically active and to eat a better diet, even separate from any changes in weight, we will see improvements in their health risk profile, from cardiovascular disease to type 2 diabetes to um, uh, osteoporosis, everything. Who will join me in my campaign that every time we have a chance and somebody talks about obesity, we can say, and what we really want to work on are the underlying behaviors of physical inactivity and poor nutrition because that's going to make a difference even if people don't lose dramatic weight. This is not a rhetorical question. I want to see if your hand is up and with me on this. And this, by the way, is not raising your hand. This is being a weenie, like, well, yeah, elbow as high as your ear. Let's go. Who's with me on this? That's all I'm asking for. Raise your hand. All right, good. Let's do it this way. Who wants to keep talking about the obesity epidemic alone because that's worked so well? That's really turning the tide on the data. Hmm. All right, good. Good. I'm glad you didn't raise your hand because if you did, I was going to berate you publicly in front of the group, which is precisely what we do to severely overweight people in our society.
I really believe that's kind of where we've ended up in the conversation. So thank you. By the way, last point, when I talk to legislators, when I can talk to policymakers, and they want to talk about health care costs and whether, we, whether Obamacare is good or whether we need a single-payer system or a, or a, or a market-based system, or, or, you know, and sort of they get in this big argument about Romney care, Obamacare, I say, shut up. I mean it. I do. I say, stop, stop. You're talking about the wrong thing. Talking about how we pay for it is like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic while we steam right into the iceberg. You want to talk about something, talk about the three health behaviors that are driving up health care costs in this country. Tobacco use, physical inactivity, and poor nutrition. Filling some 70 to 80% of our chronic care hospital beds. Everybody clear on that? You want to talk about health care costs in this country, this is the conversation we should be having. How are we going to prevail against these epidemics? Everybody good with this so far? Because this is an important starting point. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I just... It's important we start here because now we can say, let's talk about those two. Let's talk about, which is what our day is about, prevailing against those two epidemics. Good. So having said that, I'm going to admit a, a perspective. You're going to hear more about the physical activity side than the nutrition side. There are really smart people that will talk more about nutrition over the course of the day. But it also is in part because my background came. I was an exercise scientist. I worked at the Olympic Training Center and I, at Reebok's Human Performance Lab. I've been a, a nerd of the sort of the exercise science world. And perhaps most um, embarrassingly, I was a competitive athlete in the goofiest of all track and fields events. Anybody know what the silliest event in track and field is or the silliest looking? Yeah, it would be, your triple jump is a second best, I think, and I, I used to be a triple jumper, but I went sillier, and of course, it was competitive race walking. Yes, I did the silliest of all sports, and there it is, photographic evidence. Now, admittedly, it was an extremely long time ago, as is evidenced by the fact that we only had black and white photography back then, and the other giveaway is that those shorts were in style back when I was competing, this being, of course, the 1920 national championships, and... Washington, D.C., you can think in the Lincoln Memorial in the background, that part's true. And um, many people will ask, why did you choose to be a race walker of all the goofy sports you might have done? And it's obvious when I show you the next slide, well, of course, it was the huge crowds that showed up at our competitions. <laughs> this being the start of the 50-kilometer race walk in the 1984 Olympic trials, which you may recall were held in Los Angeles. L.A. hosted the 84 games. They also hosted the 84 trials several months before. That's the L.A. Coliseum. And one of my bigger thrills in sports was to come into that stadium at the end. What they do is the race walk, like the marathon, now 50 kilometers is 31 miles, so it's actually five miles longer than a marathon. You start on the track, do a few laps, then you go out and do a loop in the city marathon runners do. Then you come back in and finish on the stadium track. Well, they start you really early in the day to avoid the heat of the day. So um, at the end, when we finished, at 10 a.m., stadium was packed. They announced your name when you're coming in. In 10th place from the Greater Boston Track Club, Mark Fenton. Fenton. And that was very cool. And, you know, everybody. But you have to look very closely. And if you do, you can see that at 6 in the morning, when they started the race, that's my mom and dad right over there <laughs> cheering me on. Way to go. Sweetheart, look at you. True story. <clears throat> Supporting their son's physical activity pursuits. I appreciate that very much. I'm really telling you this so, A, you don't think I take myself too seriously, but also so you understand that I've sort of evolved in my thinking because I came from a world that was about determining lactate thresholds and sort of what your optimum target heart rate was for exercise. And, and interestingly enough, over the years, working at places like Walking Magazine and doing that PBS series, I learned that, frankly, I can encapsulate the problem from a physical activity standpoint into basically three numbers, 30, 20, 365. This is a pretty good way to think about it. If you were going to go give public testimony at your local planning board about why they should put side walks in that subdivision, you could start with these three numbers and do a lot worse than to just summarize it like this. 30, that's the minutes per day we're told every American adult should be physically active through the national guidelines. By the way, that number is 60 minutes for kids. Those are minimum recommendations. 20, well, sadly, that's a percentage of American adults that actually get that number. And here's the really scary thing. That's probably an overestimate. 365, what do you figure that is? Days of the year, don't we wish? Here's the tragedy. Add three zeros, and you have an estimate of the number of premature deaths annually due to physical inactivity and poor nutrition. Let me say it again. The only thing that kills more Americans prematurely than physical inactivity and poor nutrition is tobacco at 400,000 deaths per year. And you ready for this? Tobacco deaths look to be flattening, while inactivity and poor nutrition deaths still are on the rise. Next time they run these numbers, we're going to win. Inactivity and poor nutrition very likely to be the number one cause of premature death. Manifest is lots of different diseases, 
but that's it. So let me just amplify. These are the national guidelines. I recommend that website at the top because it's really got a good summary of the research that justifies this argument that says adults need at least 30 minutes a day, kids more like 60. These are minimum recommendations, so let me be clear. There's a dose response. If I do more, I gain more benefit as far as reduced risk for everything that kills us prematurely, the list at the bottom there. There's also growing evidence that it can be broken up. It doesn't have to be conscious exercise. That person, those kids, if they're walking 15 minutes to school and 15 minutes back at the end of the day, Plus, we pray they get 30 minutes of physical activity at school that day, then they've gotten their hour and they're going to live longer, healthier lives. It can be broken up throughout the day. It doesn't have to be conscious, formal exercise. Um, and so, yes, if I can call it this, incidental physical activity counts. This is, however, that 20% that supposedly get it, the yellow line representing those that get the 30 minutes. This is adult data, 30 minutes most days of the week. Two notable things about it. One. It's probably an overestimate because it's based on telephone survey data that called the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, the CDC collects, and we know people tend to tell you what you want to hear when they're being surveyed by phone. I'm not kidding when I say that. So, for example, what we know is for people when they're on the telephone tend to be taller and weigh less than when you actually measure it in real life. Fruit and vegetable consumption goes up when I'm on the phone as opposed to when I keep a seven-day diary. Um, furthermore, look at the graph. It's dead flat. For 20 years, we've been talking about exercise and the percentage of the population actually getting the, the, the recommended amount, even if that whole number shifts down to 10%, it hasn't changed. Telling people to exercise simply is not working. This is really important, and by the way, heartbreaking to somebody who's dedicated 25 years of their life to telling people to exercise. It's good for them. So I'm really thinking about it differently. Last little bit of public health, because this was sort of my epiphany and how I've moved to what I'm doing now and what I'm going to challenge you to do today. I think this is because of what I call the stickiness problem. And now we're to talking about stickiness. It's illustrated, I think, nicely by a great study by a guy named John Jakisic. He's at University of Pittsburgh's Medical Center, now published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. High quality research. They did a very simple thing. They tried to get people to walk 40 minutes a day. It's like so many of the intervention, exercise intervention studies out there. They gave people Lots of information. They taught them how to warm up properly and how to stretch afterward to avoid injury, how to select good walking shoes. They set up walking groups. They um, sent them email reminders and phone calls. Have you done your 40 minutes of walking today? They gave them exercise diaries and they had them fill them out. And if you turned in the tear out page of your exercise diary, you got a prize like a t-shirt or a water bottle. Because that's what we do in health promotion. We give out t-shirts and water bottles, right? Right? What are we getting as a prize for turning in our evaluations? Thank you very much. By the way, uh, first, let me check. How many of us have been involved in the proffering of t-shirts, water bottles, baseball hats, fanny packs, or any other prizes as part of a health promotional activity? Hey, thank you. Me too, by the way. My hand's up because I've given out more walking magazine t-shirts than I can possibly remember. All right. Why? Because it works. Over the six-month intervention, all three groups increase their exercise intensity. By the way, the three groups represent people being told to walk 40 minutes all at once, those told they could break their walks into four 10-minute walks, and those who could not only break it into four 10-minute walks, but they actually put a treadmill in their house, short bouts with treadmill. But that's not the interesting question from a public health standpoint, is it? It's not what happened while I'm in your face telling you what to do. The interesting question is what happens after the intervention's over. After I stop calling you on the phone and giving you t-shirts and water bottles and sort of poking you, what do you think? Do you think people tended to continue to increase their exercise minutes? Did they maintain or did it drop off? Wait, before you vote, I'm going to give you inside information. At six months, John measured statistically significant decreases in weight and increases in aerobic fitness. Let me say it again. Even with modest daily walking, people were losing weight and getting more fit. Now, based on that, everybody in the room vote for one of the three arrows. How many believe they continued? Everybody in the room has to vote for one. How many believe they continued to increase their activity level? Hands up. Well, that's depressing. How many believe they maintained it? At least they maintained because they'd had enough success. Good. And then how many believe it dropped off? You're all losers and you have a bad attitude. <laughs> I should cast you out but for one thing, which is, of course, that you're right. People who do these intervention trials know this. If I have a room full of health educators, any of you who voted for the down arrow probably have been involved in uh, five-a-day fruit and vegetable programs um, or physical activity programs that have an intensive period of intervention and behavior change, followed by leaving them to their own devices. And what you know is, you can tell me the anecdotal successes, the guy who lost 70 pounds, the woman who offer, who's offer cholesterol or diabetes meds now, that's great. But if you look at the population as a whole, the entire group, the average for the group is they drift back to their previous behavior, when all we do is behavior change. 
And, and that's a really important message because that's the stickiness problem. The problem is not short-term acute change. It's getting it to stick, getting it to stick. By the way, although there's not a lot of good data in the physical activity world because most studies just end at the end of the intervention and declare victory, there's lots of data from weight loss, and it all looks like this. Early weight loss followed by regain. Even when you look at programs like Weight Watchers, the yellow line, compared to self-help programs, the red line, what you see is early weight loss followed by regain common across the research literature. And what that has moved us to is a recognition that maybe telling people to exercise or to get on a diet is not the answer. Maybe the answer is actually building physical activity and healthy nutrition into our daily lives as a matter of normal lifestyle is where we've got to go. I can't say this strongly enough. Somebody who's been in the game for long enough, that's where we have to get. You tell somebody to get on a diet, they are counting the days till they've hit the target weight and I can get off the diet. That's not the answer. Or I tell somebody you're gonna exercise your way to fitness, that's gonna work until the day they have a kid or they change jobs or some other life thing comes into the way and they can't get to that gym anymore. I build it into every day and now I've got a sustained or sticky intervention. By the way, it's a nice study from the Cooper Clinic in Dallas, Texas, where they actually compared a lifestyle-based intervention, add steps to your day, wear a pedometer, park at the far end of the parking lot, walk your kid to school, as opposed to a structured intervention. Here's a membership at the fitness center. Over six months, you see the intervention. Two notable things about this. One, the folks in the lifestyle intervention increased their energy expenditure just as much as the both going to the gym. Everybody see that? They both saw the same benefit. They also both saw the stickiness problem. Once I wasn't intervening with the behavior change message, they were drifting back to the earlier condition. So it tells us there is promise with lifestyle intervention, but we've still got to overcome stickiness. And I'm going to suggest to you that what the research tells us is we have to take a socio-ecological approach, that simply scolding the individual, one level of social ecology, is not enough. We have to work at all these levels. And by the way, we have lots of evidence that this kind of stuff works, that what we have to do is think more about the other influences in your life, whether it's family and friends or institutions or the community by its even physical design and public policy. You tell me of one of the most heinous health behaviors we've battled from a public health standpoint and made progress on because we did it this way. What would that be? Absolutely, positively, tobacco is perhaps the most outstanding example. But there are others. Tobacco, we don't just say, don't smoke, it's bad for you, right? We've taxed the daylights out of that product. We don't advertise it on television anymore. This is a tobacco-free campus, not building, campus. You gotta leave campus to smoke, if I understand it correctly. I mean, that's brilliant. We are changing the social norms around tobacco use. Would everybody agree? As a competitive athlete, back in my day, I had to go at the airport and ask for a non-smoking seat on an airplane. Does anybody know what that meant? I meant I might be sitting one row in front of the smoking section, and thereby smoking secondhand smoke all the way to my competition at the Nationals. My kids, 14 and 17, will never experience that in their lifetimes. That's a deep socio-ecological change, right? But we could look at other things, seatbelt use, we could look at recycling, the fact that there are recycling containers every year now, that's an environmental change. Let's talk about the fact that although Haiti is suffering a horrible and tragic cholera epidemic to this moment, right now it's still going on, we would never see something that, like that in the United States. And we won't because laws and ordinances require that every time we build a new subdivision or housing tract or retail development, the planning department has to work with the public works department and the health department, mention those three departments again, planning, public, Public Works Health have to work together to decide that indeed the stormwater system, the sewer system, and the clean water systems are all built to the highest performance standards to assure we don't drink contaminated water. I serve on a local planning board. I know the exhaustive review process that they go through. It's really detailed. And that's because it's built into ordinance. It's not because we say to people, and by the way, when you build this housing subdivision, it's be nice if you don't do open pit toilets and if you make sure that clean water is piped into every house. That we don't just say it. We say, these are the rules. This is how you do it. My simple question is, why don't we do the same thing with sidewalks and bike lanes and a play space and maybe even make sure there's a neighborhood market nearby with fresh produce? We don't ask those questions quite the same way, do we? But I'm going to suggest we should. I'm going to suggest that the reason that the tobacco use, cigarette use in this country, rose and rose and rose well beyond the time we knew cigarettes killed us and didn't begin to drop until way out here is because that's when we engaged in policy level change. We changed the rules. We changed the environment. 
We made it expensive and hard to smoke in public places, and that's what's turned the tide in the battle. On top of, by the way, the good education and outreach works that we, work that we in public health do. I'm not diminishing smoking cessation programs and education and everything else, but alone, they were just not doing the job. Around nutrition, you'll hear, as I said, much smarter folks than I talk about how we're thinking about everything from what's the vending in schools and, and in our communities to, you know, sort of the density of fast food restaurants versus farmers markets. In other words, I think many people kind of intuitively get this, but I'm going to suggest to you that around physical activity, we still have the intuitive struggle, and that is people say, so are you saying, Mark, I should build a fitness center in every workplace, that every home needs a treadmill, um, that every kid should be signed up for a sports program? And I can't say this strongly enough, that's not not enough. Those are all great things, but they won't do the job because they don't master the bigger stickiness problem. What I really want to see is us build a world where that's the common picture, where a kid out on a bicycle is the new normal, or out walking to a friend's house to school. And by the way, I think of children as indicator species. If we get it right for young kids, then elderly folks, people with physical disabilities, we're going to have the entire spectrum covered. Because if we design right for a 10-year-old, then we're really designing right for a large part of the population, which is where we want to get. Okay, you should challenge me. Okay, smarty pants, fast-talking guy. Is there any evidence that if we build it, they will come? That if you actually build these kind of environments, you can over time shift behavior? And my short answer is yes. My slightly longer answer is I read exhaustively the research literature on this, and I kind of boil it down to four things. I essentially find that in communities where we have a greater variety of land uses, where those different kinds of activities are connected together by good facilities like bike trails and pathways and so on, when the destination, when I get there, rewards me rather than punishes me for showing up without my car, showing up in a physically active way. And last but not least, it's safe and accessible for everybody of all ages, all incomes, all physical abilities and disabilities. When I can say yes to those four things, I'm building an environment that will be stickier for physical activity. Let me be clear, by the way. Quick side note. The reason you're going to see tons of photos from here is because I, was, uh, I had the great honor of uh, taking a bicycle tour of part of the community I visited once before, some photos then, to work on a Safe Routes to School program at Russell Elementary, the picture on the top. And then yesterday, I got a great tour of your bike, uh, of your trail system, and some of your on-street bicycle facilities and so on. Jackie with the Parks Department was good enough to take I and some friends on, on a, a several-hour tour of the poor one. She thought she was going to go for an hour bike ride. I kept her for four hours yesterday afternoon. I said, let's ride here and let's look at that. But it's because there are a lot of great things to see. I will also say this. There are a lot of challenges. You got neighborhoods that still don't have sidewalks, no bike lanes. You got neighborhoods that don't have a neighborhood park. So when somebody says, you know, Missoula's got it all, we're all set, he's asked, say that to some of the lower income folks that live in some of your more challenged neighborhoods that don't have a single one of these kinds of assets we're talking about. By the way, who's most at risk for the diseases of sedentary living and poor nutrition? Our lowest income residents. Right? And those are often the places we get this stuff last. So I'm going to ask you to hold yourselves to the highest standard of performance. So again, using all local photos, the first element is, if I say it in English, you know, the land use planner would say, mix of approximate land uses. What we mean is have where you live and work and shop and play and learn and pray closer together. The more those things are mixed up, the more likely you are to be able to walk, take a bike, hop on the bus to go between them. The more we spread them out, the more we do modern suburban style design, housing subdivision, housing subdivision, housing subdivision, mall, housing subdivision, housing subdivision, office park. And where's the school? A giant consolidated school out here on the edge of town where the land was cheapest. And we could consolidate four elementary schools, save money on our taxes, except for if we count the long-term costs of having every kid be bused or driven there every day for the lifespan of that school, let alone the cost of a couple of additional cases of childhood type 2 diabetes. All of a sudden, that cheap land doesn't look so cheap, does it? That's a dumb land use decision that we're making all over the United States. As you come to the end of the lifespan of many of your elementary schools, and you think about, do we refurbish or do we consolidate and build big ones on the edge? Please make this a part of the conversation. When we talk about the network, we're talking about things like sidewalks and bike lanes, trails. You have plenty of examples. I can show you great examples from here. Buses with bike racks on the front. By the way, I, the number of times I see bike, I couldn't believe I couldn't get a picture of one. I saw dozens of buses with bikes in the racks. So people clearly use them here. And by the way, if you're thinking, why is he talking about buses? Why is he talking about transit? There's a growing body of research that tells us routine transit users get more of their 30 minutes per day, and that preferentially benefits low-income households. Can anybody tell me why that would be? 
You walk to and from the bus, right? They act, and lower income households, lower rates of car ownership, so they're more, well, more likely to be using the bus as a regular means of travel, thereby getting their regular physical activity. Quick side note here. This is a kind of a technical note. If I had a room full of traffic engineers, I'd say, and I can't, it's not just about having a sidewalk. It's got to be a well-designed sidewalk, one that works well. These are photos of sidewalks from all over the United States. And you'll notice where the pedestrians tend to drift in every case. Where? As far from the traffic as possible, right? I'm not cueing them, oh, get away from the cars. You don't want to get hit by a mirror, right? They know to do that. So and, um, in that case, we say, really want to set the sidewalk back. By the way, what's the other problem? In a cold weather environment where you're plowing snow, what happens to that sidewalk during the winter? <laughs> Snow's piled right up with. So we lose the first two or three feet. Now, my engineering colleagues all want to know what's the standard. Well, is there a design standard? So, you know, because that's how we work in engineering. What's the standard? We got a book. Tell us what the standards are. Well, there is. This will be the one complex mathematical calculation I'm going to show you in my whole talk, which is how do you calculate the setback? The setback is calculated as precisely one Fenton right there. There it is. We have a template. We can take it out in the field if you need to, to do some measurements. It's a very effective tool, uh, I've found. Unfortunately, it seems to have the same adverse effect on the pedestrian, doesn't it? <laughs> this is not a setup. We're out there taking this picture, and the kid's like, whoa, what's with this weird guy? My mom was right. <laughs> um, obviously, the real reason I show this is to, to say to the traffic engineers, there's not a standard. In fact, that's not sufficient. If you're going to have big trees like this, their roots are going to lift that sidewalk up, and that's not enough space. So I want a two-fenton set back there. Um, whereas if uh, even as little as an 18-inch planting strip can make a difference in an urbanized environment where I'm not planting trees. So no, the answer is that we as engineers, our job is to do what we call context-sensitive design, design to the situation. And indeed, even the striping of a bike lane provides some buffer, right? That's better than none. Um, I was impressed to see in some of the older neighborhoods in Missoula, which is not uncommon in this part of the country, a 2.2 fenton setback. Very impressive. Um, very large, what we used to call tree lawns or planting lawns. We did a little uh, cloning for that picture. Um, third element is the destination. How do we design it? Um, we've got lots of the picture in the top right in America, and historically we had tons of the lower left. The stuff in the top right we built over the last 30 or 40 years for cars. This we built for people in the lower left, right? And if you ask non-technicians, not planners, not public works engineers, architects, if you say, which is a more appealing environment to walk? Where would you be more likely to ride your bike? Everybody picks the picture on the lower left. The last thing my mom wants at 77 is to be dropped off from the bus on the parking lot, uh, at, at the bus stop at the edge of the, the, the parking lot here, and then have to pay Frogger to get to the front door. She's not going to do it. She's going to end up asking me for a ride or driving herself if she's still driving. So what we know is these attributes, like building the, bringing the buildings up to the sidewalk and having things like street trees and awnings and benches, they are not just aesthetic or amenities. They actually are functional attributes for certain users. For my mom, the bench under a shade tree might be the difference between being able to walk to a destination or not if it gives her a place to stop halfway there. All right, so, so we now understand that these are functional attributes, high quality bike parking in a secure location at the Lowell School. I got to visit the Lowell School yesterday, and let me just tell you, amazing stuff going on there. You'll hear more about them over the course of the day. But if they are at all reflective of what's going on in the school systems here, I am ecstatic to see the movement that you're making. Um, and to see a full bike rack there. I mean, that, there are parts of the country where I cannot find a bike in the bike rack. On the be most beautiful spring day, because why? They've actually passed a policy that tells kids they can't ride their bike to school because it's too dangerous. Talk about having given up. Talk about having abdicated to the epidemics. Now, wait, a quick side note. That's a, 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 a Walgreens from Portland, Oregon, which is um, a, a kind of a cool Walgreens. It's, 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 first of all, I use Walgreens because I can get pictures of Walgreens in every city in America. They're all over, right? It's a pharmacy chain, right? They're in this part of the country, right? Pull it up to the corner. They've got nice benches underneath an awning, which are serving the bus stop that's right here. They've got street trees. They've screened the very small parking lot. They've got a large bike rack that's just out of view right there. They've done, and you'd say, Mark, that's all great. But as we all know, Portland is a communist enclave. And all the communists live there, and they can do wacky stuff like that. And although some people will call Missoula the socialist enclave of Montana, arguably you're still not nearly as communist as Portland, and we want economic development. And so if a developer comes in and says, that's the standard Walgreens, that's what we're going to give you, if that's what we can get, we're going to take it because we need those development dollars. After all, have you heard we're in a recession, right? 
This is really true. And maybe you might not say that about Missoula proper, but you might say, well, the county, yeah, that's the issue. We're going to, you get out any further, we're going to take those development dollars. And interestingly enough, Wisconsin, which is also not a communist enclave, the middle of Wisconsin, not in the socialist enclave of Madison, um, they said just that. And they said when Walgreens came in and gave them the standard format, they said, yeah, we'll take it. Um, but interestingly enough, just down the road, also not a communist enclave, Appleton, Wisconsin, got this one. Building up at the street, nice bike parking, street trees. It looks like downtown. It, 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 it reflects the design of their main street. And the reason that's interesting is because they put in place policy rewards for the developers to do the right thing. It's not like you have to be at odds with the developer. But I'm going to ask you an important question. At the moment that the public hearing was being held, this is really important, so think. Let's imagine that the Planning Commission is holding a hearing on permitting Walgreens to build there. And they're going to have a public comment section. And the developer has said, we really don't want to do this. We want to give you the standard Walgreens. All these things you're asking for are going to be too expensive for us. What would have made it easier for the planning commissioners to require what you guys, with the lower picture? What would have made it easier? This is not a rhetorical question. I want an answer. Say that word again loud. Who said public support? Say it loud. You're, getting, you're all muttering like you're embarrassed to admit it. If, if public testimony, if people showed up at the hearing, maybe. I want you to say it in the first person. If I was at the hearing and said something, it could make a difference. Everybody say that. If I was at the hearing. If I was at the hearing. You are the people that can change the outcome of a public hearing like this. I can't say this strongly enough. I serve on a local planning board. Usually the meeting is me, the board members, the lawyers, the engineers, the developers, all in suits with these big fancy boards that tell us all the great benefits, and nobody from town. If 10 people, let alone 20 or 40, showed up and said, I'm part of a local health coalition called Let's Move. We care about the health of the community. I believe if you require the developer to do what you've asked for, it, the rewards will be tremendous, even for the developer. We'll have a much more profitable and higher quality property in the long run. But also, my kid could work there because they could ride their bike there when I don't have to drive them. And my mom, who shouldn't drive anymore, could still walk to that pharmacy. So it's going to benefit. That's the kind of public testimony they need to hear. I mean that. Because I guarantee you, trust me on this, the guy at the that is going to show up at the meeting is the froth of the mouth whack job who says, this is all that kind of greeny agenda, and this is, they're just trying to stifle economic development by not letting Walgreens come in. They're anti-development is what they are. I'm actually considered a pro-development guy on my planning board. I'm just pro-healthy development. Okay? That's the view you have to take. We call those guys, by the way, you've heard of NIMBYs? What does that stand for? Not in my backyard. You know who the cavemen are? Citizens against virtually everything. <laughs> they just show up at the public meeting to froth. That's it. Fourth element is safety. I can have stuff close together. I can have good sidewalks to connect them. They can be well designed. The building at the street, nice bike rack, trees, benches. If I feel like I'm going to get run over on the way there, I'm still not going to walk or ride a bike. The good news is our engineering colleagues, and you have plenty of illustrations from right here, know how to design environments where bicyclists, pedestrians, and motor vehicles can coexist. And you're using these kinds of tools. I'm so happy to see it. And I'm going to give an example of one that I'm just so proud of you for at least experimenting with, and I hope you do more. This is some of the diagonal parking in the downtown area. Local businesses like diagonal parking. It increases the density, right? You can get about half as many, half again, as many cars as if you had parallel parking. It's all good, right? More turnover for the downtown. We don't have to build parking structures. We can just use on-street parking. And by the way, it tends to narrow the street, the cars. But there are some problems. Would you admit that diagonal parking has its problems? When I go to put stuff in the trunk, I'm standing out in the middle of the street, like this, we, this woman is with the big pizzas she just bought. Um, when I open the car doors in the back for the kids to get out, where do they tend to go? Toward the road, actually. The, the door is between them and the sidewalk. They tend to back away. And when I go to pull out, what am I looking at? The big SUV that's next to me, right? I'm not seeing the bicyclist that I'm about to back into. Right? So if I really want to build a bike in a pedestrian-friendly downtown, I would love to solve those problems, but the business owners want the diagonal parking. So what's the solution that you're using here? Back in diagonal parking. And the reason I'm saying this is you're using it here. Des Moines, Iowa, not a communist enclave, is using it. No, very conservative little you know, town in the middle of Iowa. They're using reverse diagonal parking. And the reason it's interesting to me is the standard among engineers increasingly is if you're going to stripe a bike lane, you should only be using the proper. This is from right here, the reverse diagonal. And my only question is why do you only have an experimental strip? 
Now, maybe because it's controversial and people are scared and we can't back into. The thing we run into often is, but we've got a lot of older drivers who couldn't back into a, a, a diagonal spot like that. To which I ask, if you've got drivers who can't back into an empty parking space, why in the heck are you letting them back into an active travel lane? where there are cars moving 30 miles an hour. And I mean that, I have this conversation with engineers and my real point is this, I don't care about the parking. What I care about is again, we in public health have to be the ones that bring the evidence. And the evidence says fewer, less severe collisions, it's more functional, it's safer for both the drivers and the bicyclists and pedestrians. We have to take any of these discussions, whether it's trails in my backyard, sidewalks in my neighborhood, building up at the street, diagonal parking, we have to bring the evidence as health agents, which is historically what we've done in public health. We're the ones that change the conversation. When we talked about vaccination as a way to deal with infectious disease, there were people who said, you're going to take the actual virus that could kill my kid and put it in their arm? I don't think so. And we had to educate and get people to understand that only through universal vaccination could we eliminate smallpox and polio. That's our job. Now we have to talk about wonky stuff like street design and sidewalks and trails. That's the new thing. Okay, Mark, that's all good for Missoula proper. You know, the county is a much more rural area as you move out. Um, I'm going to tell you this. I think the, the rural areas are where this is most important. We know what our population is doing. We are seeing a drop in our rural population, and it's not being replaced by urban population. It's been replaced over the last 50 years or so largely by suburban population, people living on the fringes. And the reason that's interesting is because across the country, we're converting that, right, former ranch and agricultural land, to that single-use housing subdivisions where every trip is by car. Completely unsticky environments. If you ask me, the suburban fringe and the rural areas are the most important places to get in ahead, build planning and ordinance such that you get the kinds of designs we're talking about. Places that are actually stickier for healthier choices. Let's not build more food deserts, more neighborhoods where the closest grocery store with the produce section is a seven-mile ride away. Let's build neighborhoods where people can actually walk to that store or ride a bike or have good transit service to it. And indeed, I would simply say that you can't start this conversation around physical activity and not bring in nutrition or vice versa, start with nutrition. And they have to come together. They are really done at the same time. And the most innovative communities in the countries are doing that. They're looking at everything from zoning ordinances. Where do we create space for our farmers markets and our community gardens and CSAs, co community supported agricultural cooperatives, to just making sure that all of our schools have community gardens. I loved this garden over at the Lowell School. Brilliant. Largely, by the way, activated by parents. Brian Bessett, the, the, the principal there, said it is the PTA that has really driven the bus on this thing. But it's phenomenal. And, you know, they want to get to the point that they're taking that garden food and using it in the cafeteria. But let me give you another example. At the other end of the spectrum, of the policy spectrum, how about the notion that Los Angeles County, LA County, one of the most populous counties in the United States, has banned the development of any more fast food stores? No more McDonald's, Chick-fil-A. They are not granting permits. You want to build a Taco Bell, can't do it. And they did it because they looked at the data, and what did they find? They found that the highest density of fast food restaurants were in which neighborhoods in their communities? <laughs> Lowest income. What essentially they recognize is that we're building what the research literature calls obesogenic environments, neighborhoods where the only food choices are like that, and physical activity opportunities are nil, dangerous streets, unrepaired sidewalks, no bike lanes, no neighborhood park. You put those together, are we surprised that we see the highest rates of obesity and type 2 diabetes? We've designed an environment to create it. It's exactly the expected outcome that we should see in our lowest income neighborhoods. They said that's what we're going to do about it. That's policy level change. That's sticky. So, <clears throat> summarize, those are my five criteria for active, healthy living environments. Lots of good research at that website at the bottom. It's University of California, San Diego's Active Living Research. If you, you can go there and they have a great bibliographic tool. You type in a thing like um, physical activity and trails and then you'll find recent research papers on that. Maintain, it's supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, so I recommend that as a resource for you. I want to make a quick point that when we go to make the case, we're going to have to talk to other people than health people. We are all sort of nodding our heads. Well, we're the choir. What about uh, uh, when we have to go before a city council or, or a planning commission, so get your allies. And the environmentalists, the public safety folks, folks that think about social equity and so on, they're all natural allies. They may not think about it from a public health perspective. They may not be talking about 30 minutes a day. The environmentalists may be talking about reducing traffic congestion and improving air quality in the valley here, right? Well, good. Let's have a conversation. Increasingly, 
When we approach schools, and this is really important, when I go to a school principal or superintendent, and I understand some school folks are here today, thank you. It's clear to me you guys are already getting this. I say to the principal, I know three of the things you're thinking about are the health and safety of your kids. You always think about that. Academic performance and behavior in the classroom, you're always thinking about that. And lately, you've probably been thinking about the transportation budget that's a huge pain in the rear end. Kids, you're busing, for example, just a quarter mile for, to get to the school because there's a too dangerous road for them to cross. We call it hazard busing. And you're thinking about your teachers who are frustrated because every day you've got to assign them traffic duty because they've got to be outside the building dealing with literally 150 cars at pick up and drop off time. They could be grading papers, they could be working with a student, but they're out being traffic cops. I haven't once said 30 minutes a day, have I? Or 60 minutes a day for kids. I've talked about all things the principal, the superintendent cares about, and I say, well, interestingly enough, if we could encourage more walking and bicycling to your school, build the environments that we're talking about, sticky environments, we can help you with all those problems. Because we know more physically active kids perform better academically and act out less in the classroom. Darling, you're gonna talk about that, right? Yeah, so, so, you know, sort of, we're making that pitch. My point is, talk the language of your allies. But, when we go to elected officials, man, we better be able to talk about what we call ROI, return on investment. What's the economics of this? And the economics is this stuff is desirable. There's a website called WalkScore. A national business leadership group actually looked. Has anybody seen WalkScore? Punch in any address in the United States. It will give you a score from 1 to 100 how walkable that, that destination is. Go home. Everybody write this down right now, walkscore.com, and then put your address in and put in the address of the house you really want to live in. I guarantee the one you really want to live in has a higher walk score than the one you have right now. People like to be able to walk to corner stores and so on. Indeed, housing values are higher. We saw the lowest rates of foreclosure in more walkable, less, more bike-friendly neighborhoods. Let me say it again. During the recent downturn in the economy, the unwalkable suburbs of Phoenix and places like that, huge amounts of foreclosure. The more walkable neighborhoods across America, lower rates of foreclosure. Indeed, the National Association of Realtors has a publication called On Common Ground. That's the publication. Look at the picture on the front of it. They were talking about mega trends for the decade, what the next generation of home buyers is looking for. Look at the photo, guys. That's a woman on a bike with a baguette and sunflowers in the basket. My God, what have we become, the Netherlands? Look at the photo. This is not the Sierra Club. The National Association of Realtors, who are business people who care about selling homes, they're saying these are the things people are looking for. The ability to walk their kid to a park, ride a bike to a trail. These are the high value things. The business community is coming to our conversation. Again, I can talk to developers and never talk about 30 minutes a day and be speaking a language that they're nodding their heads to. It's why you're seeing the kind of mixed-use redevelopment going on in town here. I'm so psyched to see the old mill area that's just across from McCormick Park. They're talking about a mixed-use development with housing and retail and more open space, connecting to the trail system, uh, basically building a place that you could live car-free. Now, how cool would that be? Donna and you and I were just talking about that. And there are going to be people who are going to buy those things up in a a split second. That's very marketable in the world of four, five, and six dollar a gallon gas. Yes, that's where we're going. Um, but to be clear, how do we get there? Well, I think you got to do three things. This is my call to action. I'm going to leave you with this and think about this during the course of the day, and we're going to get back to this stuff when we get into the breakout sessions later. And I think the rest of the speakers are going to sort of give their correlate versions of this. Speak up, I want you to act up, and I want you to step up. There are th really three broad ways to do that. And if you ask me, what am I speaking up about? Certainly at its heart, it's about, look, go out and be physically active, eat a better, e eat more nutritionally all of the time. Help us build a healthier food system, not eat a better diet. Help us build a healthier food system that we all take advantage of. Uh, the reason my article is in your packets is because I actually just wrote this as a challenge to the public health community to think about what the toolkit looks like for physical activity that's analogous to the toolkit we've used for tobacco. So in tobacco, we all agreed, tax the daylights out of the product, make it hard to smoke in public places, villainy, uh, vilify the bad guys, basically, make tobacco industry look like what they are. We don't have as much sort of clarity around the physical activity playbook, so that's what this article is. It's to propose one for public discussion. Go ahead and argue with me about whether these are the five right initiatives. I, I invite that discussion. I want to see it in research papers and in the, in the academic world, but more importantly, in the world of practitioners. So when I talk about speak up, I mean, you know, be the change you want to see, right? Uh, um, every time you have a chance, let's think more about active lifestyle skills, not just sport and exercise. Let's think about building physical activity into our daily lives. And that may mean you gotta get out of your comfort zone. Show up at that public meeting and be the person who raises their hand and stands up and says, yeah, I like the Walgreens where the building's at the street and you got the sidewalk, I'm ready to support that. 
Which, by the way, you're doing here. You know, there's, there's evidence that there's enough interest that you've got good traction. I want to specifically mention a national initiative called Complete Streets. You guys have a wonderful Complete Streets um, um, policy that has been passed. In other words, you've already embraced the great resolution. You can read it right on the city website. Whereas public health, the environment, traffic safety, blah, 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 all will be benefited if we build more Complete Streets. Now, what does Complete Streets mean? It's very simple. At its heart, it means every time we touch a road, we think about all four potential user groups, pedestrians, bicyclists, transit and motor vehicles. So historically, we built a road and we said, and if there's some room left on the side, maybe we'll stick a sidewalk. Now what we have to do is look at a corridor and say, how do we take care of all four user groups appropriate to this corridor, right? Depending on the kinds of land uses and so on. My point, this is really important. You might think the job's done. We got the policy, we're set. Now you have to make sure that every time you touch the road, I'm talking about when the guys go out to do the routine paving and painting programs, when you're just repaving a road with a lot of potholes in it, you always ask the question, could we make this road more complete? Could we be adding a bike lane or some of those things called share rows, the shared use arrows, you know, the chevrons that say, expect to share this road with a bicyclist. What design would make this road more complete? There they are, share rows right there. You're using them. And sometimes the intervention is as in inexpensive as paint. We got to be there to make sure we don't forget, okay? So that's one of the things you could speak up on. Act up. Well, I, I really, you know, if you're here, you're already an activist. I get it. You're in the game. But are you activating for the kind of things that I want to see? Are you, you know, for innovative treatments like this, which is part of the Milwaukee Trail, really cool to see how they use these islands and offsets to really both slow the traffic and to find a bikeway. Um, it's just, and that's kind of stuff that's not in the standard engineering manuals, but if you've got the courage as a community to use those kinds of designs here, man, you're ahead of the curve. And what you need to do is more of that, universally and in every neighborhood. One of the really interesting things that struck me about the Milwaukee Trail, I don't know if anybody here has, you guys ridden it? Who's been out on that trail? It does not go through only the wealthiest neighborhoods in your community. It's a varied area. There's some industrial, light industrial areas, lower income, just striking. Um, bike share systems. So this is a fancy bike share system in Boston called the Hubway, where you have a little fob and you do it and it releases the bike and then you can ride it to any of the other stations and drop it off. Um, your guys are working toward that. This is one of the bike shares over at the, I think McCormick Park, one of the blue bikes that I got to ride on yesterday on the trail system. They're awesome, man. It's these big cruisers. I felt so cool on my blue cruiser cruising around Missoula. I felt Missoulian or Missoulian. What do you guys, anyway. Um, one of the things we should be acting up about is our schools. They have to be centers of community health. You'll hear, you guys will talk more about that over the course of the day. I was just blown away by the stuff I saw going over at, uh, on over at Lowell, um, uh, Lowell School. Um, and, you know, these are some of the areas that we'll talk more about today. For example, around physical education, both qualified teachers and a lot of contact time, and not withholding physical activity as a punishment. You know, you don't, didn't do your homework or you acted out in the classroom, you don't get recess. My God, that's the kid that needs the most recess, right? If you have a wired eight-year-old Mark Fenton who's like, blah, 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 and he won't shut up, not letting him move is the worst thing you can do. Trust me. Get him outside. Make him run for a while. I don't, but in any case... Shared use facilities, this idea of sharing our facilities, use them all the time. It was brilliant to see that the West Side Park and the Lowell School have a collaborative, and if I understand it correctly, you've got this great playground that's accessible to the school during the day, but it's part of the park uh, during, there's a splash pad there in the summer. I mean, that's a brilliant sharing of facilities. It's economically efficient. By the way, a health clinic is gonna be going in at this school. This school will become a neighborhood, that much more of a neighborhood center, right? Which is what schools should be. They should be the centers of healthy behavior in our community. Had an amazing lunch there. I've got to give a nod to Sally. She said, you guys will talk about school nutrition, but um, th this kid, these kids, I asked them, hey, how was lunch? And it was, it was my favorite. It was tomato soup, grilled cheese, great salad, apple for dessert, no cookie, no brownie. I mean, it's just, it was everything you would want. I said, would you guys, how was it? And they're giving me the thumbs up. Really good. What was the best part? The tomato soup. They really liked it. It was just so great to be around dedicated professionals. But this stuff flies when it's policy and when it's standardized and universal, not just because there's one great leader willing to do it, but we say, this is how we do it as a policy in the system. I'll leave you with Safe Routes to School as a specific sub-piece of this, which is this idea of encouraging routine walking and bicycling to school. Who's familiar with the premise of Safe Routes to School? More kids walking and bicycling where it's safe and where it's not, making it safe enough so that everybody can. Well, um, uh, these are the kinds of things, these kinds of improvements like this on Phillips Street that make it safer, but we really talk about a 5E approach that includes everything from evaluation to engineering 
to encouragement and education programs, increased enforcement where we have to, where traffic's a problem. The interesting thing, when I ask people, which E do you do first? Some people say, oh, we need to educate people that it's beneficial to walk them. We need to do uh, enforcement, slow the cars down by the school. But you all know, which one should we do first? Got to evaluate. If you're a public health person, you get right there. You say, I've got to know what the problems are before I can encourage people. Is it stray dogs? Is it traffic that's too fast? Is there a missing sidewalk? Why aren't people walking and bicycling now? So um, what we're, many schools are reporting BMI, and that's all great. If you think it's beneficial, you can do that. But I, gotta, I would beg you. If there's a thing to measure at every school. It's what we call the transportation mode split. I would love every elementary school principal in America to know how the kids arrive at that school. In Scotland, they did a show of hands survey, a nationwide one, where literally show of hands, meaning when the kids were there in the morning, they said, how did you get to school this morning? By the way, you don't ask kids, how do you normally get to school? Because if a bus comes by their house, well, they say, I take the bus. But if four days out of five, mom drives them, that's the real mode they take. So what we'll say is, how did you get to school this morning? And then sample that several times. Raise your hand if you walked, rode a bike, came by car, came in a carpool, came in a bus. You get the kind of data that you see here. That's the Scottish data. They have 50% walking. Our number usually looks like that number is car. The 40 to 50% figure is usually car in most American schools. Blows principles away. Because they know there's that lineup of cars out of there, but they assume, well, 65, 75% of our kids are in our bus zone, and the other 20% are within walking area. So, you know, that's the split. Then they hear that 40 or 50% are coming by car. That means we're running our buses. It's some potentially as, as low as 60% capacity. Where's the logic in spending the money on that? So collecting this data and figuring out where kids come from, by what travel mode and why, can lead you to wonderfully innovative programs like this one I'll tell you about from Columbia, Missouri, where they realized that very problem. And furthermore, when they set up these wonderful walking school buses, groups of kids walking with adult supervision to school, which seems like such a great answer, it's nice. But it's not super sticky, because i got to always have the parent there. What I really want to do is change the environment that groups of kids can walk alone. Well, parents weren't letting them walk even with the walking school bus because of the traffic jam in front of the school. They said, oh, the traffic at the school is so bad, I can't let them walk. So what do you do? I drive them, <laughs> thereby adding to the traffic jam in front of the school. What we did was a walkabout. We did a walk audit, and we realized there was a beautiful park right next to the school, and at the other side of the park, a very quiet street with a little pull-out parking area that could act as the bus and car drop-off area. And you didn't have to cross the street to get from the park to the school. We experimented, did a week of trials. The kids loved it. They made it a permit policy. They got safe routes to school dollars to improve the pickup and drop off area. They now have the buses all drop off at the other side of the park. By the way, you'll love this story. The teachers, when they were in the, in the transitional phase and the pickup area wasn't large enough for all the buses, two buses would drop off there and the other two would drop off in front of the school, small elementary school every day. The teachers said, hurry up and finish the drop off on the other side of the park. We want all the buses to drop off over there. It's about a 12 minute walk through the park the kids were getting. And why did they say they wanted them all walking to school? Just getting the 12 minute walk through the park. Fewer disciplinary referrals. The kids were much calmer. They were eating a better breakfast, right? Calmer. By the way, Sally De Pia, uh, La Piani, who, who is at the, um, the Lowell School, said when they had recess before lunch, it's their policy there, she had less food waste and much better behavior in the, in the cafeteria. They couldn't do it now because of the specialist schedule, but she wants to go back to recess before lunch. They eat a better meal, act out less in the classroom. My point is, this is the new normal, and they added one more policy. Five-minute safety delay. If you're going to drive by a car, the cars have to wait five minutes before they can start leaving the school. It allows all the pedestrians, bicyclists, and bus riders to safely get clear of the school. We have heard kids say to their parents, Mom, don't pick me up at the school. Pick me up on the other side of the park or let me walk home with the guys because the guys who get to walk get out an hour early. It's a five-minute delay. But to a kid, that's like infinity. At the end of a school day, five minutes might as well be just Dante's lowest level of the inferno, right? <laughs> be the people who speak up for these phenomenal trails that you're working on. It's an amazing system. And what's most impressive about your trail system is its connecting destinations. It allows me to get from where I live to where I work to where I shop to where I play. Those are the links. Get that quarter mile link to the mall off the Bitterroot Trail. We talked about the fact that it's just down the street, but it's a little gnarly. So improve that. Make it better. Keep doing that phenomenal stuff. And create a culture of bicycling. There are schools around the country that have institutionalized bicycle and pedestrian education. 
part of the PE curriculum. They're building it in. Recycle a bicycle programs. Bike corrals at events, um, you know, to sort of encourage it. How about um, this library in Austin, Minnesota, where there's a sign that says bike locks available inside. So you ride your bike to the library. You didn't bring your lock. That's all right. Run inside. Use your card. Borrow a lock. Lock your bike up and now stay for reading time or whatever else you're going to do. Completely create a culture where this is the new normal. If you're not sure what to go talk about, go online and read the phenomenal um, Missoula Active Transportation Plan that was just uh, uh, completed last year, voted in 2011. So it's very fresh. It's got prioritized lists of everything from sidewalk improvements to trail improvements. So if you're not sure what to speak up about, you got a blueprint. There's good work that's being done in your community. But it's one thing to have a document. It's another to actually put it on the ground. And you've got to be a part of making that happen. If you don't do anything else, step up. Leave your car behind once in a while. Be somebody who, who rode their bike here today, just out of curiosity. And my friend Kathy did. Good. Thank you. Thank you for being role models. Greg, I should not be surprised at all to see that you did. Next time you have this conference, it should be two-thirds, of the, half of the room, and then the third time. I mean, I know some of you live far away. That's fine. But if you don't, you should be doing what these people are doing. Because it's not really about building any particular trail or bike, or, or for that matter, you know, planting a garden at one school. It's about creating policies and norms that this is the new normal. Right? And it is not about the money. I've seen communities without two nickels rubbed together able to make the policy changes so they're chipping away at it over time. I've seen really wealthy communities that are sitting on their hands and doing nothing. There are lots of reasons we should move ahead on this agenda. I could tell you that we kill almost 4,000 pedestrians in America every year. I call this the story of four. Closer to 40,000 Americans die in motor vehicle crashes every year. But closer to 400,000, as I told you before, are dying due to sedentary living and poor nutrition. When we talk to our traffic engineering friends, we've got to make sure they understand the order of magnitude of the problem. And it's not just 40,000 motor vehicle deaths. It's an order of magnitude larger. We can talk about uh, more robust local economies, the fact that businesses now want to locate in communities like Missoula because of what you're doing here. You've got to keep doing that. So, I mean, that, this is because, you know why? Lower health care costs. It's not some crunchy granola, greeny sort of agenda. If health care costs are going to be lower because my employee retention is going to be higher and my health care costs are lower because I'm going to have more active employees, that's where I want to be. But I'll conclude with this story of this woman I met in Plainfield, Indiana. She's riding across a bridge on a trail system, not unlike your trails here. It was, had recently been put in, connected neighborhoods and a community center to their downtown where their public park is, where their ball fields were. Small town, by the way. This is not anywhere near the side. She's riding on there with her daughter, and I say, so they just put the bridge in. I do my, first, I always ask, can I take your picture? Oh, yeah, sure. Do, they just finished the bridge. She goes, oh, yeah. The whole trail system's been a lifesaver for us, actually. I said, wow, lifesaver. That's pretty strong. And I didn't pry, but she offered this story. She said, yeah, we're going through a tough time right now. My daughter, Sarah, on the back of the bike, is being treated for, and I'm thinking she called it childhood leukemia, but it was a kind of a treatment that required her to take an, an immunosuppressant drug, a drug that commune, kind of suppressed her immune system. She said, so she's not playing with other kids a lot right now. I don't want her to pick up a cold, but by the same token, I don't want her to feel like a baby in a bubble. The one part of the day she always loves is when we go out for a bike ride. If I had to go on a busy road, I'd never do it, right, with cars and the fumes and everything, but I can ride on these trails, and we're really safe, and she laughs and giggles. It's their happiest part of the day. And we can go down, we'll go down to the playground, we're going to watch the kids playing in the baseball league. You know, I mean, it's moving every time I retell the story because to hear, as a parent, you can't think of anything more challenging than a sick child and how great it was that this did something for them. But Sarah is actually my euphemism for how many other people? For the elderly shut-in who, whose kids are now debating, do we institutionalize mom now that she can't drive anymore? We had to take the keys away, she's too old. Or... Could we have her live in a community or a neighborhood where she could still walk to a pharmacy, to a corner store, to the senior center, and still be a part of the community just because she's not driving anymore? It's not the end of her life. Or it's the latchkey kid, the kid who's single mom working two jobs, who tells him, when he gets out of school, I want you to go home and I want you to get inside and lock the door so I know you're safe. Well, mom, what do I do? Well, you can watch a video, you can get on your Game Boy, you can do whatever you want, but be safe in the house. Now, maybe she says, you know what, because those trails are there, and if you walk with two of your buddies, you can walk down to the soccer fields and play, or to that after-school program over at, the, over at the, the Boys and Girls Club, because I know you can get there safely, not a lot of traffic. That's who Sarah reminds me of. That's who we have to build this stuff for. Not the guy with the $3,000 bike and the Lycra that's going to go out. Those people are fine. They're out being exerciser. 
These are the folks we have to build a healthier, stickier environment for. And if you say, my God, this guy is a raving froth at the mouth lunatic. I've never heard somebody talk so fast and not breathe for such a long time. Quite honestly, it is not, frankly, for me at all. And I don't want to make you feel bad, but it's not for any of you. Many of whom I've met and seen like really nice people, but I don't care about you guys. It's not who it's for. Who's it for? It's for Sarah, and it's for my kids, who are now 14 and 17, but I have frozen them in time at 3 and 5, because they were oh so cute back then. <laughs> I've frozen them to remind myself they're part of the first generation in modern society that's going to end up with statistically shorter life expectancies because of diseases associated with sedentary living and poor nutrition. That's not theoretical. That's the way the data is tracking. Two years reduction in life expectancy because we've built a world where they can't be free-range kids. That's unconscionable. There's no greater sin one generation could commit against the next. I know you're here because you get it. But I'm going to challenge you to raise the bar and do much harder things than you've ever imagined before. Go do the great programs you're doing. Do the outreach and the education. But I beg you to be agents of change and make your community a place that you're going to be proud that these kids are going to grow up able to enjoy a food system that brings them healthy, affordable choices and a physical activity system that lets them be active as a part of everyday life. We can do no less. Thank you. It is a great privilege to join you. I look forward to a great day. Thank you so much. Now is this on? Yes. Thank you, Mark.